All right, that was quite a ride, wasn't it? And we're just getting started. Now that we've initialized and loaded our YOLO model, let's dive into the fun part, model prediction. We'll be feeding in our Explorer image along with the save argument. Since model is an instance of the uppercase model class, calling model triggers the dunder call method within that class. Let's take a closer look. The dunder call method is a special Python method that allows an instance of a class to behave like a function when called directly. Inside this call method, self.predict is called with source explorer stream false and save true as keyword arguments. In other words, the call method is simply an alias for predict, which allows us to call the model instance directly to make predictions. Now let's jump into the predict method. If the source argument is not provided, the code assigns a default value by pointing to the assets directory, which contains predefined images that the model can use for predictions a warning is then logged using the logger to inform the user that the source was missing and that the system is using the default assets path. This helps the user understand which default images are being selected for the prediction. This line of code then checks if the script is being run from the command line interface and whether the command includes keywords like YOLO or Ultralytics along with predict or track indicating the task to be performed. The variable will be true if both conditions are met and false otherwise, which is the case in our scenario. Here, a dictionary named custom is created with default values for several parameters. Next, args is a dictionary that combines three sources of arguments, self.overrides, which contains any previously defined arguments specific to the model instance, custom, the method's default arguments defined in the previous line above, and any keyword arguments passed directly when calling the method. Notice that arguments on the right take precedence, so keyword arguments have the highest priority and will override values in custom and self.overrides if there are any conflicting keys. This ensures that the most recent or specific configurations are used for each prediction. This line removes the prompts key from args if it exists, storing its value in prompts. Prompts can provide specific instructions for certain types of models. If prompts isn't in args, it defaults to none, as in our case. Since self.predictor is none here, a predictor object is created either from a custom predictor argument or by loading a default predictor model via self.smartload. The overrides equal args part applies the current configuration settings to this newly created predictor. This function attempts to retrieve a value from the nested dictionary self.taskMap based on the current self.task, which in our case is detect, and a specified key, in our case, predictor. It looks up the appropriate dictionary for the current task and returns the value associated with the given key. In our case, it will return yolo.detect.detectionPredictor. Since self dot underscore smart load predictor returns predictor object and the detection predictor class inherits from base predictor, running this line triggers the base predictor's initialization method inside predictor.py. I know this can be a little confusing, which is why I'm detailing it here. And just as a joke, I think I've never said the word predictor so many times in my life. Next, we will dive into the get CFG function, which then calls the CFG to dict function from Ultralytics CFG init.py. It converts configuration inputs, whether file paths, dictionaries, or simple namespace objects, into a consistent dictionary format. This standardization makes it easier to handle configurations flexibly across the code. Since we have values in overrides, this part of the code ensures that any user defined overrides are properly merged into the default configuration with special handling for certain keys like save dear and ensuring that the configuration dictionaries are compatible. Next, we'll step into the check dict alignment function, which will lead us to the underscore handle deprecation function. This function is designed to handle deprecated configuration keys by replacing them with their current equivalents while also issuing deprecation warnings. The first line of code extracts the keys from both the base and custom dictionaries, converts them into sets, removing any duplicates, and assigns them to base keys and custom keys, respectively. Then it iterates over custom keys to identify any keys that are not present in base keys, adding them to the mismatched list. 
Essentially, this code compares the keys of two dictionaries and collects any keys from custom that don't exist in base. Since there are no mismatches, we step over this and return. Then this line of code merges the CFG dictionary with the overrides dictionary with values from overrides taking priority. Next, this block ensures that project and name are always strings, even if initially provided as numbers. It also checks for a special case where a name is set to model, updating it to the base name of the model file while issuing a warning to the user. Finally, it validates the configuration dictionary, CFG, using check CFG and returns an instance of iterable simple namespace, which allows you to access configuration values as attributes. This means that instead of using dictionary style indexing, you can access values directly using dot notation, such as cfg.project. Here, if the save dir attribute exists in args, it uses that value as the save directory. If it doesn't exist, the code proceeds to the else block to generate a default save directory. If args.project exists, project is set to that value. If not, it defaults to a predefined path, which in this case is the default ultradix path forward slash runs forward slash detect. The fstring args.mode is the fallback only if both name and args.name are not available or are falsy, which is our case. Since args.mode is predict, the name variable will be set to predict. Now let's dive into the increment path function. First, the path variable is converted into a path object. In our example, it resolves to runs forward slash detect forward slash predict. Next, the function checks if this path already exists. In our case, it doesn't since the predict folder hasn't been created yet. So we'll step over this. The make their flag is set to false by default, which means we don't create the directory at this stage. We then proceed to return the path. As a result, the save their variable is assigned the path pointing to the predict folder self.args.conf is already set to 0.25 and we initialize done warmup to false. Since args.show is false, we step over. Next, we proceed to create several self variables and at the end of the initialization, we will jump into the add integration callback function. Callbacks are functions triggered at specific stages of a process. They allow for customization, task automation and integration with external tools. This part of the code first imports callbacks from a module called hub cb and adds them to a callbacks list. Although we're not using the hub module directly, the settings flag is true by default and we didn't change it, so this part runs. Since we're not in training mode, we skip that section. Then the code iterates through the callbacks list, appending each function to the appropriate key in the instances callbacks dictionary while ensuring no duplicates. When we run this, we create the self.predictor object and then jump into the setup model function inside the base predictor class. Here, we instantiate the auto backend object and assign it to self.model. This step dynamically configures the model for inference using the specified settings. The auto backend class plays a crucial role. It acts as an abstraction layer, automatically selecting the appropriate inference backend based on the format of the provide model. This class supports multiple model formats, such as PyTorch, Onyx, and TensorFlow. It handles the back-end specific details, making it easy to deploy models across various platforms and hardware environments. This flexibility is what makes YOLO so powerful for seamless integration. Here, we will jump into the select device function inside torch.utils. At this point, our device is none, so we skip over that part. Next, we create a string that includes the Ultralytics version, followed by the Python version, and then the PyTorch version. Since device is still none, we clean up any unwanted characters to standardize its format. Both CPU and MPS are false right now, so we skip over that as well. Additionally, since torch.cuda is not available, we skip this step too, and once again, we move past the MPS section. We'll dive deeper into Apple's MPS in a future video. For now, when predicting on a single image, the CPU is more than sufficient. Let's move on to retrieving the CPU information. As the name suggests, this function retrieves and returns the system's CPU information from a persistent cache, defaulting to unknown if no information is found. In our case, it will return Apple M1. In a future video, when we talk about training, we'll leverage the power of MPS on my new MacBook Pro M4 Max. We'll add this information to the string S 
and save the CPU info into the args variable. This sets the desired number of threads, seven in our case, that PyTorch will use for computations on the CPU. Finally, we create a torch.device object representing the specified device, in this case, CPU. After the device is created, the code continues initializing the auto backend instance for inference optimization, open CVDNN for Onyx models and layer fusion, and the settings, FP16 data type and batch size. This prepares the model for efficient inference across the chosen hardware and configuration. With these initialization arguments, we call the super dunder init method to initialize the parent class. The code then checks if weights is a list. In our case, weights refers to the detection model, which gets assigned to W. Next, the code checks if the provided weights are already a loaded PyTorch model. Since they are, the NN module will be set to true. This calls the underscore model type method with W as the argument. The result is a tuple with various flags indicating which model types are true or false based on the provided weights. This line checks if FP16, half precision inference, can be enabled for the given model. The next line checks whether the model tensors use the BHWC format for batch, height, width, and channels, instead of the typical format used in PyTorch, which is batch size, channels, width, and height. We define the stride as 32 and initialize some additional variables as none. In this particular case, CUDA is false, so we skip over this step. Finally, the code checks whether the model type is in one of the formats that don't require downloading. If the model is in memory, it moves the model to the specified device, in our case, the CPU. As we've seen before, it does this for the last layer in the model, specifically the detect class, along with its attributes, stride, anchors, and strides.